So a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Hello and welcome, I'm Rosanna Lockwood. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. This is Prime Time, where we bring you all the stories that matter. On the show tonight, a week from hell gets worse for Keir Starmer as Labour's poll lead plummets. Tonight, we ask, can the frontrunner stay ahead with an anti-Semitism crisis in the party once again? TikTok stars rule out helping the Home Office in urging migrants not to cross the channel in small boats, but could the government still make it work? And we'll be unpacking the reported rift between the billionaire brothers who own the Asda empire. Plus, we'll bring our nightly panel looking at other stories making headlines today with consumer affairs expert Harry Kind and deputy political editor of The Sun, Ryan Savey. This is Primetime. It's a tricky old business being the front runner, isn't it? Now, Labour are not in power yet. Instead, Keir Starmer has to balance this spun glass of his party's hopes, along with its 14 years of pain and defeat, and carry all this undamaged through to Election Day, which is still looking to be at least six plus months away. Now, he may have a colossal lead in the polls, but the last seven days have shown an uncomfortable degree of inflexibility and some damaging moments that he just cannot afford to repeat. And once again, those coming closest to tripping the later leader up are all on his own team. First, the long-awaited, agonising U-turn on his £28 billion green investment pledge, along with a leak investigation that reportedly left staff in tears after the decision to water it out got out early. Next, the party's Rochdale candidate was revealed to have repeated an anti-Israel conspiracy theory. And while Labour clung to Azhar Ali for another day, further anti-Semitic remarks about Jewish quarters of the media emerged. Azhar Ali was dropped for good, but too late to find a new candidate. The very next day, another Labour candidate, Graham Jones, was suspended for making anti-Israel comments at the very same meeting. And finally, to cap it all, a poll this morning showing a seven-point dent in Labour's sizeable lead, by no means fatal, but not something that they can afford to keep happening. Now, as any veteran of opposition can tell you, if you're talking to yourself, you're giving your opponent the field. Of course, we're still battling with lots of global headwinds, not the least the Red Sea at the moment. But at the start of this year, I absolutely believe that the economy has turned the corner and are now pointing in the right direction. That's the Prime Minister today touting his record at a meeting of his business council. 
And while the Conservative Party's polling is still languishing far behind, Keir Starmer's struggles have given Rishi Sunak something of a spring in his step. Labour still have a mountain to climb. And what seems like a small wound here and there can far too easily fester, especially once a slogan or a nickname captures the minds of voters. Polling leads are all well and good, but how many more weeks like this can Labour really endure and will they? endure up to the election. Well, here to help us with all this, The Sun's deputy political editor, Ryan Saby. Down the line, we're joined by Labour peer, Lord George Foulkes, and Savanta's director of political research, Chris Hopkins. Behind today's poll, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Ryan, I'll start with you here in the studio, if you don't mind. Um, and you and I were just talking there before the show started. This was supposed to be a quiet time with uh, government in recess. Not quiet at all. In fact, a bit of a mess for Labour. What do you think the mood's like in Labour HQ? Well, speaking to people close to Keir Starmer uh, tonight, I think they feel like there's been some, some traps set for, set for them and they've fallen into them. So this week, they could have acted really, really decisively or acted a lot, lot quicker when it came to the incident in Rochdale. And they let it fester for about 36, 48 hours. And that is just too long when you have to close a story down. And uh, I think they really need, they've learned the lesson, they need to get on the front foot. This was a week where the Conservatives were going to come under pressure in the economy and they've fallen into the trap of making it a really bad week for themselves. And in terms of the defence for Azhar Ali, that originally they stuck by their man until further revelations came out from the weekend, from this meeting. Uh, shadow ministers were sent out to defend that decision made by Keir Starmer. For once, it felt like there was some unity in the party. But then, of course, Keir Starmer then had to walk back on that decision when further comments became obvious. You know, he had to let Azar Ali go as a Labour candidate in Rochdale. Do you think we're going to start seeing more of these fractures and fissions that we last saw when it came to the uh, Gaza ceasefire debate in Labour? I think when it comes to sending out politicians and people on your own side to go onto the airwaves and actually try and defend someone, I think if you do that too many times, you're going to get into big trouble. So I think if you send out Nick Thomas Simmons, who went out um, on Monday morning, you had Pat McFadden on, on Sunday morning trying to defend this. It's not that you try and you will create a fracture per se, but I just think it will create sort of tension within the party. And you want everyone singing from the same hymn sheet when you are trying to get into government. Now, the nickname that Keir Starmer probably hates more than any, that you can tell me otherwise, because you've been doing this a long time, is probably Sir Flip-Flop. It's the one that sticks. He flip-flops on decisions. That is the sense that it brings, and it's what's telling the voters you can't trust this man to stick by a decision. Given what's happened in the last few days, it's going to be hard for him to lose that title. As the trouble is, it's easy prey for the Conservatives. You go back to the £28 billion from last week, a flip-flop on that decision from being steadfast on it since um, the, the party conference in 2021. You had the delay in making the decision on, on Rochdale, and it just gives the Conservatives that credence. If you give the Conservatives an inch, they will take a mile. So this is why they have to close down these arguments every single time, because the Conservatives are one of the best attack... Uh, parties in the world and that's why they've been so successful for the past you know how, you know best part of 100 years and labor keeps serving things up for them to keep attacking look ryan we'll come back to you let's head now to lord george folks who joins us uh, down the line i just want to ask you what you make of labor's actions this week especially keir starmer's decision making oh, good, good evening rosanna nice to talk with you uh i, I think the way you've introduced this uh, item uh, confirms me in what I uh, had come to, around to believing, that this whole thing is a diversionary tactic uh, uh, organised by the, uh, the right-wing media and the Tory party, and uh, it's to take attention away from the way that Sunak has been uh, uh, challenged recently. His leadership is being challenged by Kemi Badenoch and Penny Mordaunt. Uh, he had that astonishing £1,000 uh, bet with Piers Morgan that uh, people would be de uh, deported to Rwanda before the election. And then he made this awful gaffe at Prime Minister's question when he tried a joke on uh, the, on transgender when uh, Brianna Gay's mother was in the gallery. Uh, and obviously they're desperate to take attention away from that. And you and the media are uh, helping them. And no doubt your owner, Mr Murdoch, will be delighted by the way you've introduced this item. Lord George Fox, it's great speaking to you too and I appreciate uh, your, can your candidness and your candor this evening on the show. And that's why we've invited you on. Uh, is you. to hear from the likes of you and to hear about you talking about your party. 
you've got you cannot go into an election and not expect to be scrutinized to some level um, no, there have been not, some missteps not. made by labor this week can you not agree to that much yes it, it's funny how there was a delay in the information which was recorded at that uh, uh, that meeting uh, was uh, re released uh, by the Daily Mail. You know, it, it's still a surprise. Do you know it's uh, what it's the hundredth anniversary of uh, coming up now? Go ahead. Sorry, hundredth anniversary. It's the Zinoviev letter. A uh, hundred years ago, just over a hundred years, under a hundred years ago, uh, there was a, a red scare. Uh, which uh, scuppered Ramsay MacDonald's uh, government, the first Labour government. And this letter, which uh, pretended that uh, uh, Labour was linked in some way to Russia, turned out to be a forgery. And uh, we're getting used to these kind of things now in the Labour Party. Uh, and uh, uh, the thing is, we just, to get on with putting forward our policies, uh, and uh, the, the people will see that, and we'll be doing that over the next few months. And, and when people see how their cost of living has gone up, when they see the uh, waiting lists in the NHS, when they see the uh, educational attainment going down, when they see the uh, millionaires getting richer and the poor getting poorer uh, and the uh, young people starving uh, in some of the poorest part of the country, then they'll come round to voting Labour. I have no doubt about that. It doesn't matter what you and your friends in the media whether they're owned by Mr. Murdoch or by the uh, other right-wing owners of the Telegraph, of the Daily Mail. Uh, Lord uh, Rothermere, where does he live? Some tax haven, uh, making George millions Fox. and billions of money. I'll remind you once, money. once again. And I, know, I know, Rosanna, you're doing what you're asked to do, and you do it very, very well. You're uh, a great, uh, you're, you're a very experienced, uh, uh, I'm a very experienced journalist. You do it very yes. well, but you've got you've got to recognise who you're working for, who your master is, uh, and you you do Lord what George, your master tells you. Lord George Fox, I remind you, of course, that we have invited you onto the show because we do, uh, you know, fully believe in hearing right. from all sides. We hear from every single side in this country, from came, all parties as well. On. And that's and, why I came on. And, have a look at the Zinoviev letter, and it's a very interesting thing. To, to your thing point too. on that, sir, and I'm going to go on and speak about polling, about reality of polling shortly with Chris Hopkins, but I want to also point out with your point about the Genovia letter and the Red Scare and whether or not these leaks are some sort of conspiracy, the Mail Online leak and the rest of it. Azar Ali has apologised for the comments he made. He acknowledged that he made the comments. So if there's any kind of inference here that this wasn't reality it has been acknowledged as reality by your own party i'm going to i'm going to go across to chris hopkins now to talk about the polling on this because we have seen a slight dent in labor's polling today chris talk to us about what you've noticed and is it a direct result of the last week yeah i mean i think it's impossible to say whether whether our results today are a, a direct result of what we've seen over the last week or even be you know just an outlier you know our, our, our most recent polling showed a labor lead of, of 12 points now the big sort of headline with that is that it would still we think result in a pretty significant labor majority if it was to be played out at a general election but at the same time our polling a fortnight ago showed a lead of 19 points and that would have been an absolute landslide potentially you know putting the conservative party in, in, in a real pickle come the come the next election so you know we do believe that there has possibly been the start of some movement away from the Labour Party, but really it's far too early to tell, as I say, A, whether that is going to be an ongoing trend or whether this poll is just an outlier, or B, whether if that is an ongoing trend, whether it's down to the events of the last week or not. And Chris, what can you tell me about the way that voters are thinking at the moment that you're polling? Are they looking at the Labour Party as Sakir Starmer? Are they looking at the policy points or are they looking at Labour as a sort of cohesive whole? I mean, I think let's make no mistake that Labour's lead that they have built up over the last two years is has been a vote away away from the Conservative Party or to Conservative voters uh, voting against the Conservative Party rather than for Labour. I think there is still a perceptions issue with the Labour Party, whether um, whether Labour peers or Labour MPs believe that to be legitimate or not, you know, isn't really for us to say. But we measure public opinion, we measure public perceptions, and there is still this this idea of the Labour Party that the public aren't entirely clear what they stand for and i think one of the reasons why they are in this this you know, very large lead position even though our lead does appear to have come in somewhat is because
because the Conservative Party have been, uh, frankly, a bit of a disaster over the last two years. But that's not to say that the general election at some point this year is a foregone conclusion at the moment. I think Labour Party still have to secure those votes. They still have to make sure that, that, that they do have enough direct switches from the Conservative uh, 2019 vote. And it remains to be seen whether they can do that. And I don't think that long term, weeks like the week that they've just had is necessarily going to stand them in good stead for a short campaign where that scrutiny is just going to intensify. Chris Hopkins, Lord George Fox, Ryan Sobey, thank you for a fascinating discussion to open this show. We'll see Ryan again later on in the programme. And let's remind you of the other candidates running for Rochdale. Azhar Ali is on the ballot for the Labour Party despite his suspension. Independent candidate Mark Coleman, Simon Danchuk for Reform UK, Ian Donaldson for the Liberal Democrats, Paul Ellison for the Conservative Party, George Galloway for the Workers' Party of Britain, Independent candidate Michael Howarth, Independent candidate William Howarth, Guy Otten for the Green Party, Ravin Subortner for the official Monster Raving Looney Party, and Independent candidate David Tully. Well, next year on Primetime, shop staff scared to go to work as thieves who ransack their stores with machetes are being given a free pass. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well. Would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. Yeah. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it UnpopCon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Welcome back. You're watching Primetime with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Now, imagine going to work and being shouted at, spat on, racially abused, sexually harassed or even attacked. That's what retail workers are facing on a daily basis as shoplifting spirals out of control. New figures showing 16.7 million incidents were recorded last year. That's double from the year before. It cost retailers 1.8 billion the first time. It surpassed the 1 billion mark. 
Violence and abuse has also increased as many as two in five employees face mistreatment, especially when confronting the criminals. The co-op alone says it's recorded more than 300,000 incidents of shoplifting, abuse, violence and antisocial behaviour in 2023. That is up 40% on the year before. Just last week, a machete-wielding gang stormed a co-op store in West Yorkshire, leaving staff terrified. The chain's campaigns manager, Paul Gerrard, joins me for more. Paul, we knew things were bad last year. How surprised are you about how bad they've still continued to get? I'm not surprised because in talking to colleagues up and down the country in the 2,500 co-op group stores, then I hear every, every day about what they're facing. As you said, we've seen a 44% increase in crime in our store. We've seen a 36% increase in violence. And the um, footage that you're showing there from one of our court stores in West Yorkshire is, is, I'm afraid, shocking, but it's not that unusual to my colleagues. Every day there'll be a thousand incidents in court stores. Every day more than 100 of my colleagues will be threatened abused or attacked very often with weapons like the the individual there who is carrying a machete you're talking about very very violent styles of shoplifting when did i mean it's always been around shoplifting of course since the dawn of time uh, and we have seen uh, sort of quite a lot of violence involved but do you think there is a noticeable increase in the type of violent shoplifting you're talking about here using kind of weapons like machetes so there has always been shoplifting, but what's behind the 44% increase we've seen and the 50% increase across this sector is that we are now being targeted by organised criminal gangs. We're being targeted by individuals who are really clear that they are coming in to steal a huge volume of product in one go. They will be using that not to for their own needs. They'll be selling those in pubs, clubs, into restaurants, independent retailers. We've heard of pubs where there are pop-up stalls selling stolen co-op goods. And I think when you have that level of organisation, and I speak as a former customs and excise law enforcement officer, when you have that level of organised crime involved, what will come with that is violence. They are, they are coming in to absolutely target those stores. They will do whatever they need to do to get that product out of their stores because they have orders waiting for them. So unfortunately, when you've got that level of criminality, you will get violence that goes along with it. And my colleagues in stores serve communities, stood by us all through lockdown. They deserve greater support than they are getting. What is the effect that it is having on your colleague? I mean, it must be terribly frightening for staff to have to deal with this type of thing. I mean, um, every day colleagues will deal with abuse. If you are a woman or you are from an ethnic, ethnic minority, you will face misogyny and r racism, just abuse. You will face threats with our colleagues who've been threatened. The families have been threatened. The colleagues have been threatened with sexual assault. We've had colleagues threatened as they leave the building, as they leave the store. We've had colleagues threatened in their own home where individuals have turned up at their own home. And that's before you get to attacks of involving knives, involving baseball bats. We've had colleagues stabbed in the face with, with a dirty syringe. Those colleagues are, as you can imagine, concerned, they are worried, they're often very scared. And that's why I think the Retail Trust, in a report last year, said that a third of retail workers are looking to leave the sector and they're looking to leave it. One of the primary reasons for that is the violence and abuse that they, that they face. And retail employs three million people in this country. It's a core anchor institution in all our communities. Now, in terms of policing, police say they are trying to attend more incidents, but according to your figures, two and five are walking away with police failing to attend. Talk to us about what measures you want to be seen improving here. You want attacking a shop worker to be made a standalone offence. What else do you want to see happen? Well, the first thing we need is, is we need the police to take these issues seriously and to turn up and attend in instances of violence, in instances of large-scale theft. And you're right, currently two in five walk away. What I would say is if you go back to October and the year from January to 2023 to October 2023, four out of five times people were walking away because the police weren't turning up. Since October and the Retail Crime Action Plan, we have seen just the beginnings of a better response from the police. And I think there's a credit for that. Former law enforcement officer, I'm not here to, to criticise the police necessarily. So we have seen some movement. It's very early. We need to see that maintained and not have two in five walking away, have none of them walking away when they've already been detained. What we also need to have then is when the police turn up, they need to have all the powers available to them. And that includes a standalone offence, Rosanna. And absolutely, I think that if Parliament gives a group of people an obligation to uphold the law, 
as they do for retail workers in relation to age related sales they should absolutely get specific protection but i also think very simply it works and why do i know what a standalone offense works because in scotland they've had it since 2021 and in scotland 60 percent of the incidents reported under the standalone offense result in an arrest 60 percent in england and wales it is penny numbers five six seven percent so we know in scotland it has resulted in better police focus greater reason for prosecuting violent individuals we need that in england and wales because no matter where you're working in a shop you're supporting that community you deserve to be protected it seems like a straightforward uh, policy point to me paul let's hope we see it come into effect continue your campaigning maybe we'll get some movement paul gerard campaigns manager of co-op thank you well next tonight is TikTok the answer to solving the UK's illegal migration crisis. Well the Home Office certainly seems to think so. Home Secretary James Cleverly prepared to pay influencers on TikTok up to £5,000 to create videos urging migrants not to cross the channel in small boats. Draft documents seen by the Times reveal mass advertising campaigns will take place in Albania, Iraq, Egypt and Vietnam. We have plans to also introduce these schemes in Turkey and India. So since over 100,000 people have made the crossing since 2018, will this scheme have the desired impact? Joining me to discuss this, Home Affairs Editor at the Times, Matt Dathan. Matt, thanks very much for making time. Uh, it seems like a fairly neat concept, given uh, various journalists said when they've gone to places like Albania, they've spoken to people who decided to uh, migrate to the UK and they were done. They did so because they were sort of promoted videos in which people that felt like them and were the same age as them, sort of peers from Albania and from other countries, basically promoting life in England. So the Home Office is trying to tackle this by doing the same, but in reverse. Yeah, that's right. The Home Office is determined to try and uh, target migrants on the same channels as the people smugglers. And as we've seen in the last few years, people smugglers have been very successful in attracting and persuading migrants on TikTok and other social media platforms. So, the, yeah, the Home Office has been uh, trying, well, the, the last three years, actually, it's been launching uh, advertising campaigns uh, on mainstream TV, radio adverts, newspaper articles, uh, but also social media. But what it hasn't done is been able to target the same sort of cohort of young uh, men who are traveling or thinking about traveling to the UK uh, for work for economic reasons and so it's come up with this plan to pay uh, those more influential voices who young men uh, listen to and, and, and uh, engage with that might be more of a authority and more of an influence on them um, when they're thinking about traveling to the UK. And there's one other element why the Home Office is using uh, influences on TikTok it's because of the cross-government ban on the use of TikTok currently uh, which means that the Home Office can't go out and advertise directly on, on that platform. Interesting. And also, you know, uh, young people might be less inclined to listen to the Home Office of the United Kingdom than they might, you know, an influencer that speaks their language. Because when you're thinking about these countries, you need people who speak Albanian, uh, uh, you know, Arabic, Turkish, various Indian dialects as well. If we're talking about those countries we mentioned at the top, that's a serious project. It feels like it might be quite expensive too. Do you have any sense of the costs of this? Yeah, the, the Home Office will, uh, I mean, we must be clear also that this is only at the moment a draft plan. It's quite an advanced plan. They're hoping to roll it out uh, when the flights to Rwanda start so they can uh, they can warn people if you come to the UK, you will be sent to Rwanda um, through these uh, influences. Um, but um, but you're right, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, quite a costly plan. Uh, it's going to be, cost a maximum of £5,000. They put a cap on £5,000 on each influencer in Albania, for example, which is the more advanced plan. Uh, for the uh, Vietnam and the Egyptian influencers, uh, they've got an overall budget of £15,000. Um, uh, so the Albania one is 30000 in total. So we're, sort of, we're talking about six influencers in total. And Egypt and Vietnam is going to be about £15,000 each uh, dedicated to that. Uh, but it's part of a much wider campaign the Home Office is going to roll out when those flights start. Uh, so it's, in total, it's going to cost about a million pounds advertising in six countries um, as they sort of really ramp up the communication. Because we've got to remember that it's all worked very well having a policy like Rwanda and claiming it will create a deterrent effect by, uh, by, by basically stopping people making that journey because they'll be carted off to Rwanda. But if, you, if people don't know about it, then obviously they'll keep on coming. It's a bit like... Uh, a criminal who doesn't know that he'll be sent to prison if he commits a certain offence. So they've got to communicate that uh, hardline new policy when it is rolled out. 
Matt Dathan, Home Affairs Editor of The Times. Thank you very much. Well, next here on Prime Time, no love lost between delivery drivers and their app-based overlords this Valentine's evening as thousands go on strike over pay and conditions. We'll be live from the picket line next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpop con. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. You're watching Prime Time with me, Rosanna Lockwood. Now, thousands of delivery drivers are on strike tonight. As they say, a cut in fees from employers like Uber Eats and Deliveroo mean they can no longer survive. Refusing to work on one of the busiest takeaway nights of the year, they say company profits have soared while they work long hours, sometimes even facing violence, all for pennies. Figures suggest the last time drivers walked out, it cost companies around a million pounds in lost orders. Taking a short break from one of the picket lines to speak to me this evening, delivery driver Uli Choffi. Thank you very much, sir, for making time. Um, just talk to us a little bit about why you are striking today. The reason why we're striking tonight is because uh, delivery companies are lowering the fees. We can no longer survive uh, on the fees they're offering us. People think that we get paid by the hour, but that's not true. We get paid by delivery. Delivery companies like Uber pay as low as £2.80 for a 1.5-mile trip, and the delivery has slashed their fees from £4 to £3.15. We can only make an average of three deliveries per hour. So if you make the maths, we are making... Uh, up to 12 pounds, but this is gross. We also had to put money aside for tax, insurance, and buy expenses like carriage and petrol. And I remember when these delivery companies started and this idea of a zero hours contract and you guys cycling around and being masters of your own destiny was kind of 
portrayed as being a gig economy thing, something that you could opt into or opt out of, but you're telling me that the payments are actually decreasing? Yes, uh, the payments are actually decreasing. So imagine if people now uh, have to work longer hours. So people who were doing eight hours, now they had to do 10 hours. People who were working five days, now they have to do six days just to make ends meet. And this is affecting not just our finance, but also our livelihood. We have a lot of working men who don't have time to look after the children, can see the wives. And this is creating like, uh, well, it, this is really affecting uh, people's uh, mental health and all sorts of things. Of course. I mean, look, you're standing this evening on the sidelines. You've just gone somewhere a bit quieter, but you're on the picket lines, I understand. Yes, it's very in, noisy. There, <laughs> in Battersea yes. in London. Talk to us about yes. the other people that you're there with today. H how long have you guys been out there? What stories have you heard? Right. So uh, people are really upset and angry, especially because we are seeing on the news that these companies are attacking, talking to the media, but they are not actually addressing our problems. They are not really uh, talking to us. So we would like to ask them, why are you talking to the media and why are you not talking to us? Why? At the end of the day, these companies without us are just a nap. That's true. Without the drivers, they're nothing, actually. And they, I need to let the viewers know that companies like Uber Eats, Just Eat and Delivery say they are listening and that drivers do make at least minimum wage. But as you have painted there, it's a very complicated picture. Let me ask you this. If they bowed to pressure, what would you rather? That they suddenly made you guys employees with benefits and perks? Would you trust them to do that? Or do you want to just see an increase in the amount that you can get paid in the current system? We want them to sit down with us and have a, a, a proper conversation. This is not just about London delivery drivers. This is also about people from all over the country. It's not because we're striking, yes, that uh, we will accept an, a, a, a deal that just will uh, uh, fulfill our, our, our desires. So this is about the whole country, the whole drivers community. Only so if they are willing to do that, then uh, we are happy to talk to them. But it needs to be for everyone. Well, certainly you've grabbed a lot of attention. Valentine's Day, a very clever day to do this on, obviously very deliberate. Uh, and we will let you get back to the picket line. We really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Uli Choffi, thank you. Well, next tonight, they are two of Britain's most successful entrepreneurs, brothers from Blackburn, Mosin and Zuba Issa, who made a fortune running a petrol station empire before going on to acquire supermarket giant Asda in a £6.8 billion deal some three years ago. They have combined net worth of more than £5 billion and they oversee 200,000 people across 10 countries. But recently, times have been turbulent for the Issa brothers, as they're known. Not only are there reports of a growing rift at the heart of the family firm after one brother left his wife for his former auditor, but now it has emerged they borrowed millions of pounds from their petrol company to repay debt taken on to buy two private jets. Not to mention the older brother is thought to be trying to get out by selling his Asda state. You'd be forgiven for thinking whether this empire might be on the brink of some serious trouble. The editor of The Business Desk joins me now, Michael Taylor, and I understand you've been following this story somewhat. Um, the, this has been a rolling story for some time, but it's the private jets that have grabbed the headlines this time. What's all that about? Yeah, thanks, Rosanna. It's like succession, but with petrol stations, isn't it? It's an absolutely brilliant story with all the ingredients. There's big money, there's billions, there's lending. But then, of course, now there's the private jets that it turns out that they, they borrowed a load of money in order to buy a private jet for them to, to, to go around and, and look at the rest of their empire. It is a fascinating tale. There's absolutely no question about that. But let's not forget, you know, when I drive down this away to go and watch Blackburn Rovers, um, in near their, near their hometown, you know, it reminds you what a massive contribution they've made to the economy in Lancashire, the, the jobs that they've created, the ambition that they've shown to grow it. And that's why our readers like to, <laughs> to read about this amazing northern success story. Yeah, and it is an amazing uh, northern success story. We can't really uh, take away from that, nor, nor do we want to. Um, but obviously the uh, developments within their lives have caught headlines, um, as is the nature of media. In recent uh, 
months and I think it's fair to uh, assess how important that is to the succession of their succession like you put it there of their empire uh, because Asda employs so many people how safe yeah. is it looking at the moment yeah well they they gave evidence to a parliamentary committee which has often been the graveyard of many people's reputations in business uh, where they get caught out by very tricky questions from M MPs and, and it's, it's fair to say, by their own admission, the Issa brothers didn't do a great job of it. And then they sent their private equity investors from TDR in. They, they did a much better job of attempting to reassure MPs that they that they'd, um, ASDA was in safe hands. You know, it's a great British institution. It's been owned by Walmart, an American, um, an, an American retail giant. But it, it's in their hands. They have suffered from um, strike action. Uh, particularly in one of one of their their stores in in Gosport. they've uh, they've had industrial action. They've, they're, con they're constantly getting stuff from the from the trade union saying that they're not being paid a proper wage. And and I, and I think the real danger is that you know you've got Morrison's and ASDA both owned by private equity investors, and they're under an enormous amount of pressure with a rising debt pile. You know, we're all hit at home. Our household finances are hit by rising interest rates. I think what that does to somebody who's borrowed billions and billions of pounds and dollars in order to buy an asset as complex and as big as Asda, with all their labyrinth um, offshore structures, Jersey, the Isle of Man, and, and all points in between. Yeah, and that's a point that often gets raised, you know, exactly that. High interest rates hurt a lot of us when it comes to mortgage rates and basic loans. The wealthy, you know, tiny violin, I know for a lot of people, but the size of their loans, you've got high interest rates on those and you do start to see where trouble emerges. Look, we have reached out on this show to an EG Group spokesperson. EG Group is the business that they built up, the petrol forecourt business. They provide us with this statement, quote, as previously disclosed to the Financial Times in 2022, loans to the Clear Sky company are fully disclosed in the EG Group accounts and continue to be so. These loans have been provided at rates comparable to the average commercial rate of interest. The interest has been identified and recognised within EG Group's finance income. Uh, and just reading through that, Michael, that's the first time I've seen next. It's just been delivered to us. Uh, it makes it clear to me that they're basically saying uh, the loan was completely above board. All the numbers are completely clear and above board. Uh, you know, is there anything you want to add to that from what you're seeing? I don't think there was ever a question, even in the Financial Times' is reporting, whether it was above board or not. But what they haven't admitted in that in that statement is the business that they're um, having a loan to pay for is is for the provision of a private debt for their personal use. That, that just makes for great drama and a great story. But it is it is potentially an example of great hubris as well. That's, that, I think that's the nail on the head here, and why this does continue to be a story. Because, like you said, there's no. Uh, accusations here that anything has happened untoward from an accounting or finance perspective. Everything is there. It's just what they've chosen to spend money on. We'll have to just wait and see how it all pans out. But of course, with great money comes great scrutiny. Uh, Michael Taylor, editor of The Business Desk. Thanks for joining us. Okay. Next here on Primetime, I will be joined in the studio by the panel. We're going to go over some other top stories from the day, including singletons using artificial intelligence to find love. That's next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed that if they do no. turn then no. you can be no. in trouble i've got a cockapoo no. if that cockapoo turns on me i win the battle i don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the you know the corner of the street or whatever i think it's a nonsense <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant 
despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Well, welcome back. Time now for our primetime panel to dissect some other big stories from the day. Joining me in the studio, consumer affairs expert Harry Kind and deputy political editor at The Sun, Ryan Sabe. Chaps, thank you. Uh, we've got a couple of fun stories to get to tonight, but before we do that, let's delve in something a little serious, actually. Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has claimed a deep fake audio of him attacking remembrance events almost caused serious disorder. This flake clip circulated around social media late last year, appearing to show the Labour politician saying he didn't give a flying expletive about remembrance events. Um, now, we're not going to replay the clip because this is sort of that part of it is old. What is new is him talking about how this almost came close to causing what he's, what he's calling serious disorder. Also, replaying the clip is irresponsible in itself. It's fake. It's not him saying this, but it is a, a sign, Harry, of how much this type of thing is going to become an issue. It, it's not just growing, but it's spreading internationally. You know, mm. we've already had a Biden robocall being used to encourage Democrats to stay home from primaries. We have had in Pakistan in a very convincing fake Imran Khan telling people that, oh, our party is boycotting the election, so don't turn up. And that's really troubling in a, a nation with a high level of um, low levels of literacy that you are going to be able to propagate this kind of fake news and it was going to be very difficult to row it back. It, it's it, kind of impossible to say now how many people listened to that deep fake clip of Sadiq Khan, believed it, and then just didn't see any of the retractions, didn't mm. see any of the, you know, the news story saying this was fake, and will you know, go to their graves believing that that's what Sadiq Khan said. Yeah, and it also obviously, I uh, don't know where it originally stemmed from, but mm. plays into the hands that he doesn't care about remembrance and all these types of things. And, you know, Ryan, the government have said they're going to get on top of AI. We hosted this great AI summit a few months ago that Elon Musk came to at Bletchley Park, but actually the UK seems to be falling behind a little bit now. Uh, yeah, you've got to be ahead of every, every step of the way, and there's a, a, the next AI conference is going to be taking place in South Korea later this year. And it's you think Rishi Sunak being front and centre at last time will make sure that Britain... Is is there and also I think as well you have to take the big countries with you you have to take America you have to take China every step of the way because if you don't you know you every need everyone singing from the same hymn sheet on this otherwise you, all these countries can get in trouble and also this year you've got so many countries going to the polls you've got America you've got India you've got Great Britain mm -hmm. it's gonna be really really tough um, to actually make sure that all oh, this is this is this is controlled yeah, it's not just the audio clips, but the images as well. They can be very powerful in persuading people. That next, millions of O2 and Virgin Media customers are bracing to be hit with broadband and mobile price rises of up to 8.8% from April. 
For example, a Virgin Media customer paying 29 quid for an 18-month contract will now pay an extra 30 quid, 60 pence a year. I mean, we're used to price hikes. Harry, this is mm. pretty much your life's work is talking about price <laughs> yeah. hikes. Uh, but there are some serious price hikes going on here. Yeah, these are, I think, particularly nasty price hikes because... Most price hikes, we have a choice. We can shop around and avoid them. But these are price hikes in the middle of contracts, mm. and you can't avoid them without paying a stiff penalty. And what's particularly bad about the Virgin 02 ones, which were announced today, is that instead of being linked to inflation via CPI, which is what most people use, they do a bit of inflation shopping, and they go for RPI. And without wanting to go too statistics nerdy here, RPI includes housing. It uses an arithmetic mean rather than a geometric mean, I believe, and so is at a higher rate, which allows them to claw back a little bit more money. Now, it's not huge sums. It's like a difference of 20p a month for a £25 contract. But by choosing that inflation figure, they are making, you know, probably millions over the, over the broad base of their customers. It's the last time they're going to be allowed to do it because it seems like Ofcom is going to uh, rule this practice to be unfair. Mm. But this April, I, most of the mobile operators, most of the broadband operators, they're clawing back that last opportunity to make some cash. Goodness, it does seem quite cynical. Look, Ryan, I've long had a theory that dictatorships um, around the world like to quell the masses by giving them cheap warmth and cheap TV and cheap internet. <laughs> and in this country, if things don't get under control, I mean, is not in the government's interest to kind of stop these prices getting out of control? You'd have thought so, especially when you see the inflation rate out today, it's at 4%, and then people pick up their, their letter or their email from their um, provider, and it says it's gone up by 8.8%. You're thinking, well, this doesn't quite, this isn't quite tally. And again, it sort of feeds into to the whole sort of story of everything getting too expensive for people, um, it whether whether it's you know train fares, uh, internet, mobile phones, everything just seems to get more and more expensive, and people get more and more upset and. They, they look for alternatives. Including Valentine's Day, also <laughs> getting more expensive. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Roses are red, prices are up. Traditionally, Valentine's Day is one of the busiest times of the year, of course, for retailers. But business owners have warned about having to pass on these inflationary pressures to customers. Defying forecasters, inflation was held at 4% in January. So it is coming down slowly. We're starting to feel the impact. But Valentine's Day has long been a price-gouging tradition, Harry. Why would they charge less for roses and romantic dinners? Oh, absolutely. Like, if you want to look at inflation, it's the inflation between the 13th of February and the 14th <laughs> of February, which is astronomical. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's a real boon for a lot of businesses. Restaurants have been hit hard the last few years. Independent florists, that kind of thing. I, I do think there, there's a real supermarket battle to try and give you the cheapest red roses. And I would really worry about those because... I don't think roses are cheap. Uh, uh, I, they should be more expensive, is what I think. I think inflation isn't high enough for roses. These are shipped sometimes from mm. Kenya. Mm. They've got to be refrigerated that whole time. Use of pesticides is extortionate because they're not a foodstuff. There is, it's a really uh, unnecessary expense. And if we're thinking about things that we could potentially cut back to save the planet, I think flowers would be quite high up there, replace them with lovely local British plants, native species. I think that would really help the environment rather than hurt it. I spoke to a cargo pilot who talked about yes. how they fly fresh flowers from Ecuador to the Netherlands <sighs> to then trade them, to then bring them back to, say, places like the UK. I mean, you, when you hear the journey these flowers go on... To spend seven days yeah. in my kitchen unloved. That being said, Ryan, girls love flowers. I got a lovely big bouquet today. Have any of the uh, prices put you off? I did, so I didn't buy any, actually. I look, <laughs> I, look, I, look, I look at the prices every single year, and they, I they always thought they used to be quite reasonable, but in the last few years, they've just gone up and up and up. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, 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 my wife got a card, and that's about as far as it goes. <laughs> you can get something in a soil pot, maybe, something that's a bit more sustainable. Look, and um, I th hear Harry's point, actually. I don't think you need to get rid of flowers, but surely mm. make them um, as expensive expensive as they should be to maybe stop people buying so many of them. Let's stay with the topic of romance, though. How romantic is this AI? Back to that topic, artificial intelligence. According to a new study from a cybersecurity firm, McAfee, almost a quarter of Americans are now using AI to enhance their profiles <laughs> from 15% last year. Heartfelt messages written using AI are apparently helping to boost match rates more than original content. Let's talk about this. And, you know, I'm aware that from what I know of you both, you're both family men, both married men, mm -hmm. so I know you're not on the dating apps. Uh, but 
this is an entertaining thing to consider, isn't it? Because people are beefing up their CVs these days with AI. Why not dating apps? Well, exactly. And just before coming on, I downloaded the Riz app, which is the, one of the most popular apps for this, which basically, I, I know how much do you love Riz. Uh, <laughs> I do. It, it takes the conversation that you're having on a dating app, you input their response, and you, it comes up with some, you know, AI-generated, clever lines. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not too worried. It's not Bergerac-level quality <laughs> for its responses. Uh, I, I, I'm very glad it didn't exist when I was dating because it would have been a steep decline when uh, Beth realised that I had zero cool, I had zero chat, uh, and it was all a robot. <laughs> The Riz app. I'm going to yeah. get on that. Give I mean, try. Ryan, uh, if when you were a man before marriage, uh, <laughs> you had the opportunity for a robot to give you some better pickup lines, would you have taken it? I think, I think before I got married, I don't think these computers or apps even existed. It's such a long, <laughs> such a long time ago. But I think the trouble is, you get found out very quickly. You can sign all, all you know, all these, all these, you know, great lines in the on the app, or um, but when you actually meet them in person, they're going to think your mm. chat is pretty poor. So uh, well, yeah. and that's the point with this AI app stuff because you know apps are already people complain about being catfished by mm. pictures people don't look like how they seem in the pictures if people are now using ai not only just filters but yeah. you know they can pretend they're a scuba diver and they're not it, well, exactly <laughs> and that's and that's the upside really the real worry is that this being used for romance scams mm. that there are huge compounds of thousands of people using ai and translation to catfish people into bitcoin scams that allow them to to basically fleece you from all over the world ai makes that easier and so people really need to be aware that just because they've got good chat, it doesn't mean that they are actually real and like you, I'm afraid. Indeed. Look, Harry Ryan, thank you. Mike Graham standing by. What have you got coming up on the show tonight, Mike? Yeah, thanks very much, Rosanna. Yeah, we've got an exclusive tonight uh, because we're interviewing Liav Eitan. He's the man at the centre of that Soho theatre incident, a terrible thing that happened last uh, Saturday night uh, when a man was attacked by comedian Paul Curry um, for not supporting the Palestinian flag. He's going to tell us his story, and it's all coming up right here on Talk TV at 8 p.m. It certainly is. Look, the Independent Republic of Mike Graham from 8 p.m. tonight and tomorrow night as well. That's all we've got time for on Primetime tonight. Thanks to the studio guests. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. 
It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just